Thank you so much for joining us as we journey through the book of First and Second Kings. This video was made to help us be better at reading the Bible. Sometimes it's hard to pick up the Bible and know what the heck you're reading or what it means. And so as we're working through a series called Will God Come Through? We want to read through the book that that whole series is based off First and Second Kings. And since it's hard to read the Bible sometimes, we thought we'd read it together and see what it says, how we can apply it to our lives, and how we can be better at following Jesus because we know his word. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name's Tim. I'm one of the pastors here at Searchlight, and I'm so excited to be helping us walk through this part of scripture. Make sure that you're subscribed to our channel so you never miss any of it but we're going to get started walking through the book of first and second kings and so first and second kings is this really fascinating book with really rich theology and some really crazy characters and kings is kind of a middle book in the old testament it's actually a sequel to first and second samuel and the book of first chronicles which tells the story of the rise of david uh, and what kind of leads us to this events of first and second kings uh, and so reading those are a great companion piece if you've never heard of those books they're worth reading but they're setting up for us what we're going to read which is first and second kings which as the name implies is the story of the kings or the monarchs of ancient israel so it's the line of david is those first couple of books and we joined uh, the story in First Kings where David is actually handing off to his son Solomon and every successive chapter will be about uh, the different kings that follow Solomon and whether they obeyed God or they didn't obey God and it covers a wide range of history almost 400 years so we're reading uh, it's about 1000 BC to about uh, 586 BC uh, give or take a couple of years uh, there's some disagreement some scholarship but it's kind of crazy because this is focused in on one place this is Israel this is God's chosen people right the whole Bible is the story of God's people. And the Old Testament is this nation that God has forged for himself. And sometimes it's it's easy to get lost in the weeds and not understand what else is going on in the world. So when we say we're going to read the story of Solomon and the kings of Israel, this is nine, uh, 970 BC, before Christ was even born. So there's a lot going on in the world. The Iron Age has really just started in the Middle East, so like 1100 BC. So before that, they weren't using iron at all. Um, it's kind of crazy to think of these giant jumps that were made even here during the times we're going to read about, right? And the rest of the world, we're talking about like it's 900 BC before the Iliad and the Odyssey are ever written, right? These great works of ancient Greek literature, right? The, the Olympics, uh, happened for the first time in 776 BC. So 200 years after David, the Greeks have the Olympics for the first time. They start to form their nation states. That's Athens and Sparta, that kind of thing. Rome is founded in 750 BC, right? Again, we're talking 250 years after David, after the start of this book. Socrates is going to be born like 100 years after this book ends. Same thing, Confucius, Buddha are born over 100 years after the book of Second Kings closes. Islam won't be founded for another 1,000 years by Muhammad in almost 600 AD after Christ. Uh, it's just crazy because this book happens in a context and it's concerned with a certain people at a certain place. But it is the story of God's people. And so a lot is happening in the world. And First and Second Kings actually going to focus on God's promise to David and the story of his people that he's called and he's made into a great nation. So it's really fascinating because this book is grounded in history. And Kings is kind of a court-style document. It's going to recount the rule of different um, kings in Israel. And eventually the kingdom will shatter into two different pieces, Israel and Judah. And it will recount the, the lives of both kings in Israel and Judah and whether or not they obeyed God or not. And the outcome or the fallout, really, of those decisions. It also takes a big section to talk about the prophets Elijah and Elisha. Maybe you've heard of them, and we'll get into that. But the first, the book of Kings, and I'll say Kings because First and Second Kings originally was one kind of document, and uh, it was kind of broken up later on to kind of kind of help with the study of it. It's the same thing when they in, in kind of inserted chapters and verses. You know, that's not really in the Bible. Um, it's just kind of to help people who are studying it. And so from an early translation, that was broken. But so when I say kings, I mean both first and second kings. And the book of first and second kings presents this picture of Israel. Um, and it's just a contemporary record that it's funny because we can compare to other nations, right? We're going to read, for example, there's this guy named Omri, right? And he's a king in Israel. And he get seven verses in all of First Kings, seven verses for his entire reign. Uh, but we actually have an Assyrian document uh, that actually says that Omri was one of the most important rulers of the northern kingdom in terms of his political and economic achievement. But the author of Kings kind of dismisses Omri as unimportant because what he's focusing on is how well he followed the laws of Deuteronomy, the laws of God, the laws of Moses. And in that regard, Omri was a very bad king for Israel. And so Hezekiah is a king that's given three whole chapters in the book of Second Kings. Uh, but 
in other documents, he's not mentioned nearly as much or as in-depth. And uh, Jeroboam II, he's going to count for what some other countries around Israel call the true golden age of Israel, and he only gets eight verses in the entire book of Kings. And so uh, from a political standpoint, Omri and Jeroboam II uh, are important figures. But here in this story of the monarchs and how well they followed the law and how well they worshiped the true God and how well they uh, honored the temple that has been set up for them by Solomon, um, they're treated as just a few short verses. And it, it's, um, it's crazy because on the other hand, there's really short ministries of Elijah and Elisha, and they comprise almost a third of the book, uh, even though they were only active for a couple of years in this 400-year monolithic story. And so the author's purpose is not to present a complete history of Israel, but to emphasize certain events and to keep the focus on the promise of God to the people of promise and how well his people kept their promise, their covenant to him. And, and so our author wants to show us that the kings who led the nation to obedience, uh, to the Mosaic law, to all the rules, precepts, the covenant of God, and more frequently those who led Israel away from those laws uh, is actually going to result in how God deals with the nation as a whole, that they're representative of how things are going for God's people. In the book of Kings, the author wants to reflect on the history of the monarchy. Uh, it's a human king that's sitting over a theocratic nation, uh, and this, this king had responsibilities laid out in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, you know, the first five books of the, the, of the law, the Torah, uh, lay the precepts that he's supposed to be following. The author's concerned to show how they actually followed or didn't follow the law and what came because of that. And so the principle of obedience is going to be a big uh, principle in the book of Kings and how obedience will bring blessings and disobedience will bring disaster and that God is actually active in judging individuals and nations on the basis of this covenant. Uh, how the author uses this as the criteria to evaluate each and every king. Did they obey the law or did they not? Spoiler alert. Most did not. And so Kings will recount how Israel is going to split into two kingdoms. Like I said, Israel, the northern kingdom, will be destroyed in 722 B.C. And the southern kingdom called Judah, where Jerusalem is, will ultimately be conquered in 586 B.C. With the temple that Solomon built, we're going to read about that in 1 Kings 8, ultimately being raised to the ground by King Nebuchadnezzar and his men. And so after the division of the kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel lasted slightly more than 200 years, right? We're talking to about uh, 722 BC with 20 different kings and the southern kingdom, Judah. So that's going to be a distinction we'll draw a lot. North is Israel, south is Judah. And this is based on the 12 tribes uh, that make up the nation of Israel. We'll talk about that in the future, don't worry. Uh, the southern kingdom of Judah had the same number of kings, 20, but um, many of them actually, well, more of them followed the law and were obedient to God. And Judah lasted almost 150 years longer until its ultimate destruction in 586 BC. And then the nation of Israel was exiled uh, into Babylon. And all along the way, the prophets are going to pop into the story. It's really crazy because Kings really sets up the rest of the Old Testament that's going to follow, right? All these prophets show up talking to the nation in this time frame, right? The, the minor prophets, they call them minor because their books are short, knocks are less important. And the major prophets, they're all going to be active during these 400 years we're about to read about. Amos and Hosea denounce injustice in Israel uh, about 760 BC, 725 BC. Micah speaks against both Israel and Judah between 747, 722 BC. Isaiah prophesied the destruction of of Israel and Judah about 737 BC. So remember, this is uh, Isaiah who's going to prophesy that the king is coming, the thing we love to read about uh, Christmas time, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and we call wonderful counselor, mighty God. 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah is prophesying to the divided kingdom. Jonah, right, preaches his message to Nineveh, uh, which is run by the Babylonians in 612 BC. That's about 100 years uh, later than Isaiah. Uh, Nahum uh, celebrates the destruction of Nineveh, uh, af sorry, about 100 years after Jonah, uh, which is kind of crazy. Jeremiah, Zephaniah, both warned the people of Jerusalem prior to its fall, 587 B.C., that it's going to be judged for its unfaithfulness. Um, Habakkuk asks God why he allows cruel Babylonians to succeed and crush his promised people. Uh, Ezekiel, uh, uh, one of the prophets, 597 B.C., so a little bit later, and he predicts the fall of Jerusalem and speaks out about the return of exiles back from is uh, back to Israel after they're going to be exiled, and so Judah falls. The Jewish people are carried into captivity in Babylon. It's about 
five, uh, 587, and then it's 536 BC, so it'll be gone about 70 years. And that's when we're going to read from the book of Daniel. Daniel was actually in exile, taken away to Babylon at the same time as Ezekiel, and he's persecuted for his faith, talking about like 539 BC, 5, 598, 539. Uh, it's kind of that window. The Book of Lamentations, it's a whole big sad book. It's a collection of poetries, uh, poetry that's lamenting the destruction of Jerusalem, which happened 587 B.C. Obadiah uh, decries Edom, which is a country that was taking advantage of Jerusalem after its fall. Uh, Haggai, Zechariah, they spur the return of exiles to rebuild the temple. That's 520 B.C. So this is after the kingdoms have fallen, and these, these prophets are saying, you're going to return. It's going to happen. This is coming. And then comes the story of Israel returning home. The rest of the books we read about. Esther becomes queen of Persia, uh, and more Jewish people return to Jerusalem under Ezra, and then under Nehemiah, and Nehemiah re will rebuild the walls, and Joel writes about hope the exiles will have. Listen, the, the rest of the Old Testament is answering the questions that Kings is going to set up. Uh, questions like, what about God's people? Is there hope? Does he care? Is he still in control? And Kings is actually laying out ahead of time that God is in control, and it's going to explain why Israel is going to be defeated and ultimately um, sent in shame into Babylonian exile. And Israel's God is deeply in control of nature and history. Uh, there is no other true God anywhere, uh, but it's this good and all-powerful God who oversees the destruction of even his chosen city and temple, and Israel's exile to Babylon because Israel's sin has brought about these punishments. Uh, but it ends with this air of hope. Uh, and it's kind of the coolest closing is it's just ultimately pointing to the descendants of David who 400 years earlier we told the story of who will finally succeed where all these other kings have failed and establish a kingdom that will never ever end. And so First and Second Kings are really important books. Uh, I'm excited to read them together with you. I hope you'll join us on this journey. Uh, we'll try to do a chapter a day every weekday until we're done. Some of them are big chapters. We'll see how they all break down. Uh, but the best thing you can do is subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash searchlightchurch, so that you never miss any of these videos. If you miss them, come back and watch them. Here's what you can do. Interact. Leave a comment. I don't care if it's an emoji or an oh, that's interesting. But the more comments, the more subscriptions, the more it goes into their algorithm and more people see it. So help us reach people by liking, commenting. If you have a question, go ahead and put that in the comments. I'd love to deal with some of your questions. You can put them in the comments. Or if you don't want them to be public, you can just email them, Tim at Searchlight Church. Com. And so I'm excited to grow together. And as you kind of read First and Second Kings, uh, if you have questions, go ahead and ask them. But uh, I think it's going to be a great journey for us to kind of explore the Bible together. And I'm so excited to be doing this with you. So make sure you subscribe, share this video. And we as a church, we're not only going to learn about God's Word, but we're going to read it together and apply it to our lives. Thanks so much for signing in today. Can't wait to see you tomorrow. Have a good day.